Welcome to No Compromise, where faith and reason fuse in conversation. Jenny and I continue our conversation of mice and men in C.S. Lewis's The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. At that moment, they heard from behind them a loud noise. Okay, so let's find out what happens after we do our gnawing, Mm -hmm. after we as mice do our gnawing. At that moment, they heard from behind them a loud noise, a great cracking, deafening noise, as if a giant had broken a giant's plate. What's that? said Lucy, clutching Susan's arm. I I feel afraid to turn around, said Susan. Something awful is happening. They're doing something worse to him, said Lucy. Come on. And she turned, pulling Susan round with her. The rising of the sun had made everything look so different. All colors and shadows were changed that for a moment they didn't see the important thing. Then they did. The stone table was broken into two pieces by a great crack that ran down it from end to end, and there was no Aslan. Okay, so we know the stone table had the laws of Narnia in on the foundations of Narnia. It's kind of like what makes Narnia, Narnia, right? It's interesting because the witch, we know previously, it was said that she sacrificed her victims on the stone table, and then she goes and kills Aslan on the stone table. And she's not really the type of person that respects laws or religion. So why would she even sacrifice on the on the stone table you know what was the purpose and so i was thinking don't you think it was her way of desecrating those foundations the foundations of narnia through sacrificing and then and then eventually killing aslan or god on his own words right. desecrating his own words in, in its own you, way you desecrate both of them at the same time it's kind of like in Paradise Lost, mm-hmm. Satan respects the beauty of reality, of God, of the structure that God creates, and God's own image in man at the same time as he seeks to, to undermine destroy it. destroy it, yeah. As he recognizes it oh, as the power that is and hates it because right. it is the power that is. And seeks to undermine it. I shouldn't say destroy it. I should say defile it. Mm -hmm. Oh, defile. That's that's, very good. Yes. To defile the word of God. Mm -hmm. Yes. To to sacrifice God on the foundation of the laws of Narnia. And tear all of it down at once. Yes. Oh, it's too bad, sobbed Lucy. They might have left the body alone. Who's done it? cried Susan. What does it mean? Is it magic? Yes, said a great voice behind their backs. It is more magic. They looked around, and there, shining in the sunrise, larger than they had seen him before, shaking his mane, for had apparently grown again, stood Aslan himself. His glory was back again. His glory came back because of the mice who loosened right. loosened him, and then the girls cleared it all away, right. and there was Aslan. And we have to understand that that is actually how God works. Right. Aslan's not He doesn't have to. It. Right, right, right. He's not surprised and he doesn't have to work that way, but he chooses to he do chooses that way. He chooses to. Right. Oh, Aslan, cried both the children, staring up at him, almost as much frightened as they were glad. Aren't you dead then, dear Aslan, says Lucy? Not now, said Aslan. But what does it all mean, asked Susan, when they were somewhat calmer. It means, said Aslan, that though the witch knew the deep magic, she knew she understood religion. Right. She understood the Satan, foundations. Satan understood the the laws of God. Just like in heaven even, and on earth. Even those who oppose God today, they understand religion. They understand the traditions. There is a magic deeper still, which she did not know. Her knowledge goes back only to the dawn of time. She understood only what man understands, only as a non-spiritual man, you know, a soulless man. Like, that's all she knows. But if she could have looked a little farther back into the stillness and darkness before time dawn, she would have read there a different incantation. She would have known that when a willing victim who had committed no treachery was killed in a traitor's stead, the table would crack, and death itself would start working backwards. And now, okay, so at this point, I want to say that if she would have understood the simplicity of God's word and understood what she couldn't see and understood the mystery, I think she would have understood the gospel. She would have seen it anyway. And what is the gospel? It's not man reconciling God to us. 
it's God reconciling man to himself. It's like we're not trying to make God's word fit our scientific theories and our higher criticism. But Lewis says the deeper magic is that God is reconciling us to him. And I would say he's given us the foundations of his word as a place to start and not a place to bind him down that this is what God's word means, but the place where God reconciles us to himself. Yeah, it's very parallel to Satan in Paradise Lost. (laughs) Satan lives in his own mind, its own place. This is exactly what the witch is doing. Right. She is creating God in her own image. She's creating reality mm-hmm. in her own image and refusing to allow reality to correct her. Yeah. This is the paradigm of science that we've been following from the, the Enlightenment onwards. Mm-hmm. The idea that reality must correct our vision of reality. Right. That is, our metaphysics should be corrected by reality itself. And that is the Christian view. It is that God, true reality, must correct our subjective vision of reality, our map. And when we allow God to do that, then we are getting a true vision of reality and not the false one that the witch is living here. Yeah, yeah. And then also when we come to God as like as a child without any knots or convoluted cords, and we take him at his simple word. And you know what? We find that he is not a tame lion as church and as religious tradition would like us to think he is. And I think this is what Lucy and Susan experience at this point. And it's what happens when we allow God to come alive in our own lives. Mm -hmm. This is the uh, part that really gets you, right? Yeah, I love this part. (laughs) I love it so much because it's the spirit of play. Right. It's the spirit of God being free. Right. So set it up where we have the field mice come, they loosen God, they gnaw through these cords and and these knots and and we and God is free now in, in society and in culture in the world and he comes alive in us. And he does what no one expects him and to we do. find out he's, not the religious leaders. i was going to say he's not tame <laughs> yeah he's not tame yeah he's not a tame lion oh yes now said lucy jumping up and clapping her hands oh children said the lion i feel my strength coming back to me oh children catch me if you can and he <laughs> stood for a second this is funny he stood for a second his eyes very bright his limbs quivering lashing himself with his tail Then he made a leap high over their heads and landed on the other side of the table. That's the foundations, the the foundations of Narnia, the the word of God to Narnia. Laughing, though she didn't know why, Lucy scrambled over it to reach him. Again, it's like the God's word is, is the foundation. It's like where you start. You start at the table and you scramble over to get to to God. God. Yes. Right. And it's, it's like the springboard to reach him. Aslan leaped again. A mad chase began round and round the hilltop. He led them, now hopelessly out of their reach, now letting them almost catch his tail, now diving between them, now tossing them in the air with his huge and beautifully velveted paws and catching them again and now stopping unexpectedly so that all three of them rolled over together in a happy laughing heap of fur and arms and legs. It was such a romp as no one has ever had except in Narnia. And whether it was more like playing with a thunderstorm or playing with a kitten, (laughs) Lucy could never make up her mind. (laughs) And the funny thing was that when all three finally lay together panting in the sun, the girls no longer felt in the least tired or hungry or thirsty. And once you come to that point with God, you're not thirsty or hungry anymore. Mm -hmm. He just keeps filling you and filling you and filling you. It was, you may say. Satisfactory. Satisfactory. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) And that is what the experience with God is. He's like 
sometimes hopelessly out of our reach. Yes, there's the asymptote. Right. We almost catch him. We he he dives in amongst us. He lets us almost catch him. He tosses us in the air. He rolls all over together. If you <laughs> if you notice he That's what we've been feeling together. Right, as exactly. We've been doing this journey together. Yeah. There's moments when we glimpse God and it's so exciting. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And we're, we're reaching out and we're, we're, we're thrilled. And then at the next moment, it's like, oh, now what? Where, yeah. <laughs> where, where are where you? Are... How do I find you again? Right. Exactly. How do I again glimpse that beauty? And, and that rather fun? than letting that destroy your faith, it just draws you farther right, up. Right. It draws you farther up and further in. Did I get that right? Yep. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, and Lewis almost talks of the same asymptote that. Dr. Kurt Wise talked about always getting closer, but never reaching so that for eternity, there's going to always be something to be reaching for. And it's the same thing that the atheist or the secular scientist or the academic scholar, they can't understand because they take the soul and the creator and they either disregard both or they bring them down to earth and try to write, you know, the scholar tries to reconcile God with their human theories and explanations and they bind God tightly with convoluted knots and cords. And then they miss the deeper magic completely. And and in doing so, they miss that God is drawing you to him and reconciling you to him. And not I keep- Go ahead. I keep loving the words, the deeper magic. Yeah, and that is and the deeper magic. So much of mm. my adult life has been the demystification of of life. Life, right. How everything seemed to me as though what we needed to do was take away all of those supernatural superstitious superstitious notions. Right that humankind has lived with mm-hmm. take away the magic right. and live simply in the muck the, the mud. Oh, hold on i'm going to say it again always winter never, never christmas, christmas. <laughs> it's exactly right right and that is the logic right of the atheist position whether they're willing to trace it out or not and so seldom are they willing to trace it out but when i traced it out i came to the end as my mother would say, mm-hmm. of myself. Right. I came to the end of the position and it is empty. Right. It's kind of like the atheist always says to you, you believe in Santa Claus? I don't believe in Santa Claus, but I believe in Christmas. Mm-hmm. I, that's a great, that's a really great you know what I'm way saying? to address that point. Right. Yes. Right. I do believe in Christmas. Right. That is that God invaded the world right. and gave us a pathway right. to find him. Right. And I also believe in winter. Mm-hmm. I know what winter is, scientifically speaking, mm-hmm. but I know there's also a Christmas. Yes. Right. And a spring. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. A rebirth, a resurrection. Exactly. And unfortunately, a summer, a hot summer, (laughs) a hot, hot, humid summer. (laughs) No, I'm just kidding. And now, said Aslan presently, to business. I feel I am going to roar, and you had better put your fingers in your ears. And they did. Again, and, not the time, not the tame lion. Right, exactly. When he feels like roaring, he's right. going to roar. Be careful. <laughs> and Aslan stood up, and when he opened his mouth to roar, his face became so terrible that they did not dare to look at it. And they saw all the trees in front of him bend before the blast of his roaring as a grass bends in a meadow before the wind. Then he said, we have a long journey to go. You must ride on me. And he crouched down and the children climbed on his warm golden back. And Susan sat first, holding on tightly to his mane. And Lucy sat behind, holding on tightly to Susan. And with a great heave, he rose underneath them and then shot off faster than any horse could go downhill and into the thick of the forest. Now, this is fun, too. That ride was perhaps the most wonderful thing that happened to them in Narnia. Have you ever had a gallop on a horse? Think of that. And this, this is, is the journey. This is the last four years for me. Right. Because Since coming back to yeah, God. Somehow or other, we're riding on Aslan, you and mm-hmm. I. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's true. The journey is so exciting. Exactly. <laughs> Think of that. And then take away the heavy noise of the hoofs and the jingle of the bits, which is the reality. You know, horse riding is the reality. The jingle, the hoofs, the heaviness of the hoofs. Take all the reality away. 
Forget about it. Imagine instead the almost noiseless padding of the great paws. Then imagine instead of a black or gray or chestnut back of the horse, the soft roughness of golden fur and the mane flying back in the wind. And then imagine you're going about twice as fast as the fastest racehorse. That's where I think we are spiritually, huh? Yep, for sure. We, yeah, we've had enough of it all and all the back and forth and the tearing apart of God's word and reconciling God to our world or reconciling to our science, reconciling him to our history, reconciling him to our, just us, to humans. I, for one, have stepped out and said, in the beginning, God, and everything from there on, I'm just taking his truth because what Lewis says next here, it describes exactly what I'm feeling. This is a mount that doesn't need to be guided and never grows tired. He rushes on and on, never missing his footing, never hesitating, threading his way with perfect skill between tree trunks, jumping over bush and briar and smaller streams, wading the larger, swimming the largest of all. And you are riding not on a road, nor in a park, nor even on the downs, but right across Narnia in spring, down solemn avenues of beach and across sunny glades of oak, through wild orchards of snow white cherry trees, past roaring waterfalls and mossy rocks and echoing caverns, up windy slopes alight with gorse bushes, and across the shoulders of heathery mountains and along giddy ridges, and down, down, down again into wild valleys and out into acres of blue flowers. Yes, we can trust our God right. and dare to enjoy the journey. Right. Right. And he doesn't need to be guided and he never grows tired and he rushes on and on. He never misses his footing and never hesitates. A mouth up with wings like eagles. She'll right. run and not be weary. She'll, she'll run and <laughs> not be weary. She'll walk and not she'll faint. Oh, we should know that. Yeah, we, should. <laughs> we were just talking tonight about how we were looking at our life right now and thinking how weird it was. We never, <laughs> ever, ever would have thought the things we were doing right now, we would be doing right now. And I mean... In our wildest imagination. It's totally... I mean, it would never even come into my mind yep. like 10 years ago. But here we are. Mm -hmm. And we said about how trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, understanding and all your all ways, ways acknowledge him yeah. and he, he shall, shall direct, direct your, your path. path. And it's like... The path we're going is not <laughs> what I thought. It is, it is a wild yeah. roller coaster ride yeah. because we never know what's going to happen to us when we get up in the morning. Mm -hmm. And there are moments of sheer terror as we're plunging down the other side yes. of the hill, right, on the <laughs> roller coaster and getting ready to, you know, screaming to come up the other side. Right. And it's, we have no idea what's coming. Right. But right. it's like that ride that. Lucy and Susan. Susan are experiencing here. Right, right. He never misses a stride. Right. And we can trust him in that. And and um, not that I always succeed in trusting. No. I still get scared. <laughs> <laughs> but we said about how he gives you the desires of your heart. It's oh, not goodness. that he gives you what you want. He knows what he, you want even better than you right know. and so he gives it to you and you're like if in all your ways you acknowledge him he and you trust that he will direct your paths let it all go yep oh my word <laughs> <laughs> it's like i didn't know yep. that i would ever this is not my plan at all <laughs> no. but then, it wasn't even in my imagination but it's exactly, but exactly. suited to me yes yeah, it's amazing. It's satisfactory. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was, you may say, satisfactory. <laughs> so so that, that description there of Lucy and Susan riding on Aslan's back, that's what we want. And as I said last week, when I mentioned the dwarves in the last battle, this is the last book of the Chronicles of Narnia, the last battle, in that the dwarves are sitting in the darkness of a hut. You'll have to read the context yourself, because I can't go into all of that right now, but they're sitting in the darkness of a hut and they're not willing to be stable. of a stable. That's right. And they're not willing to be taken in by Aslan yes. and they're not willing to be taken in they're by rational, right? Purely or, rational. We will not be deceived. Right. And they won't be taken in by false religion that was going on on the outside of 
of Tash? Tash, yeah. They won't be taken in by that or any religion. This is the part where they absolutely refuse to see Aslan, but he still provides for them a lovely meal. It, it kind of reminds me of the world today. Those who kill God, those who convolute God and his word, and those who try to bind him. Aslan raised his head and shook his mane. Instantly, a glorious feast appeared on the dwarf's knees, pies and tongues and pigeons and trifles and ices, and each dwarf had a goblet of good wine in his right hand. But it wasn't much use. They began eating and drinking greedily enough, but it was clear that they couldn't taste it properly. I think of science and, and, and just everything. Like God gives them the knowledge. Oh, the tremendous bounties yeah. that the Western world has provided. And we look at I'm talking as, about in knowledge, yeah. just in knowledge, the, the knowledge that God gave us. And it's clear that they can't taste it properly. They thought they were eating and drinking only the sort of things you might find in a stable. One said he was trying to eat hay, and another said he had got a bit of old turnip, and the third said he's found a raw cabbage leaf. And they raised golden goblets of rich wine to their lips and said, Ugh, fancy drinking dirty water out of a trough that a donkey's been at. Never thought we'd come to this. And they all said, and this is, like I said, they, that God's given them, given us a rich bounty that we could learn so much mm -hmm. if we start in the right place. But they all say, well, at any rate, there's no humbug here. We haven't let anyone take us in. The dwarfs are for the dwarfs, you see. Dwarfs are for the dwarfs. Boy, this is exactly the mirror of the atheists that I can talk to and confront on YouTube. Right. When they comment on our videos. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And here's what... Aslan's answer is, you see, said Aslan, they will not let us help them. Yeah, they won't see reality. They have chosen cunning instead of belief. Their prison Mere is... Mere rationalization. Right. Their prison is only in their own minds, yet they are in that prison and so afraid of being taken in that they cannot be taken out. And this is where you and I stand now. But come, children, I have other work to do. That's what Aslan says. Right. And this is where we stand now. I have other work to do. I have no time for tying Aslan in it with masses of ties and chaotic knots anymore. Right. Tired yeah. of these disputations. Yeah, exactly. You know, That's don't, exactly don't right. Don't tell me that there is no God and try to give me your arguments and all the rest. Mm -hmm. Tired of dealing with it. Right. It's time to move on from there. And, and and tired of bringing God down to earth and trying to explain why this is this and that is that and the Word of God is this and this part of the the Word of God. I'm, I'm just tired of all of those knots and cords inter intertwining. So I think the first thing we need to do now that we come to the end of the chapter is to be lowly mice who chew through these knots, the knot that's been placed in front of us or the cord that's been placed in front of us that bounds Aslan, whether it be in your own life, your community, your country, the world, your family, your marriage, wherever you are, chew through the cords that bind God right. where you are. I mean, as the Christian atheist, I'm trying to look at the broad perspective of the net and the network of the knots. Mm -hmm, exactly. But that doesn't matter. It right. really doesn't. Right. Because if we're going to unravel it, I can help you try to see it. Mm -hmm. But what you need to do is gnaw the knot that's in front of right. you. With Each and every one of you. Right. You are who gets it done. Right. Not us. Right, right. We get nothing done. Right. And All we can do is hopefully say to you, no, you're not. Right. And it, it doesn't matter what your education, your job, nope, it, nothing, it really where doesn't. you are, you've been placed where you are. Yes. God's giving you the ability. Yep. And as we see with Aslan. <laughs> yeah. If you don't see what we see, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. You be faithful. Exactly. Just as Jesus said to, who was it? Peter, mm -hmm. stop worrying about yeah. what is going to happen to John, John. <laughs> or any of the others. Do your job. Mm-hmm. Be faithful in the right. things that I've given you. Right. As Aslan said, I will tell you your story. Right. Other people's stories are theirs. Right. You do what you're called to do. Exactly. And stop. And be faithful with it. Right. And don't look horizontally, look vertically. vertically. And then listen to God say, but come children, I have other work to do. Yes. You know, undo what you can do 
what you can undo, and then crawl away like the mice and go further up and further Before in yep. with, with God. God. Right. Because that's your main concern. Right. So um, now we're going to take you, we're going to confuse everybody even more. We're going to go to the Silver Chair, <laughs> which is another book in the Chronicles of Narnia. <laughs> because <laughs> Puddle Glum, the character, if you haven't read that, you have to read that book too, because Puddle Glum's quite a character. Yes. And we love he, Puddle Glum. Bit of a sad sack. <laughs> <laughs> he and two children and the prince of Narnia at the time, they're under the, a spell by the Green Witch, and she's trying to convince them. In the underworld. She's, un, she's in the underworld. She's trying to convince them there is no God. There is no overworld. There is no Narnia. And, and Aslan is just a myth, and Aslan is just a figment of their imagination, a, a child's dream. A child's story. Right. And she keeps casting an incense sort of thing in the air, which kind of makes them dizzy. And Right. So it's the magic. Mm -hmm. of the rational story that is meant to lull us into believing something false. Right. And to get out of that, Puddle Glum, who's kind of like a frog person <laughs> thing, <character>. yeah, <laughs> he goes to the fire and he burns his foot. Right. He Stamping burns out it. the smell. And there's nothing, nothing that will negate enchantment so well as the Smell of burnt marsh wiggle. Right. <laughs> it must be pretty bad. <laughs> and so when he burns himself, he sacrifices himself to, you know, by burning himself to bring everybody out of the spell, he gives a great speech. Right. One of our favorites. We've quoted it before, but it's worth bringing it here again. Yeah. Pologlum comes back and announces to the queen of the underworld. One word, ma'am, he said, coming back from the fire, limping because of the pain. One word. All you've been saying is quite right. I shouldn't wonder. That is, you've presented a very rational picture mm -hmm. with which it is very hard to disagree. Right, right. I'm a chap who always liked to know the worst and then put the best face I can on it. So... I won't deny any of what you said. But there's one more thing to be said, even so. Suppose we have only dreamed or made up all those things. Trees and grass and sun and moon and stars and Aslan himself. Suppose we have. Then all I can say is that in that case... The made-up things seem a good deal more important than the real ones. Suppose this black pit of a kingdom of yours is the only world. Well, it strikes me as a pretty poor one. And that's a funny thing when you come to think of it. We're just babies making up a game, if you're right. But four babies playing a game can make a play world which licks your real world hollow. That's why I'm going to stand by the play world. I'm on Aslan's side, even if there isn't any Aslan to lead it. I'm going to live as like a Narnian as I can, even if there isn't any Narnia. So thanking you kindly for our supper, if these two gentlemen and the young lady are ready, we're leaving your court at once and setting out in the dark to spend our lives looking for overland. Not that our lives will be very long, I should think, but that's small loss if the world's as dull a place as you say. Mm-hmm. I love that speech. That just brings, <laughs> brings me to tears when I hear that every time. Mm -hmm. How can I cry that often of something I've read a million times mm. before? I'm can, a sentimental sob. I can testify to that. <laughs> <laughs> you can walk past your poems on the wall yeah, and cry. But <laughs> it's not what I think. Mm -hmm. Atheists who would listen to us talking about this would accuse us of. Mm -hmm. It's not that we are saying something like, I choose the imaginary because it's, right. it seems better. Right. No. It's that, look, this is something that I've experienced mm -hmm. as a reality. Right. 
And now you're giving me a story, a rationalization that presents a pretty compelling narrative that says maybe all that I've thought and believed for so long is wrong. Right, right. Should I abandon all of that? Or should I hold on to that which I used to believe, which I thought I had really good reason to hold Mm -hmm. on to? And Puddle Glum is saying here, wait a second, what I'm dealing with now is deeply and profoundly affected by the immediate circumstances in which I find myself and all sorts of emotional things and realities that are playing on my immediate sensibilities. Mm -hmm. But the things that I held on to before were also incredibly rational, and I believed them for good reason. Am I going to abandon all of that just because at this moment I have good reason to doubt it? Mm -hmm. And he says, no. I'm going, I'm going to, to hold on to the value right. that I found before right. that all of my life has shown to be valid, true. I'm going to search for that. Right. I'm going to hold on to that. And I'm going to let this momentary vision pass. Mm-hmm. And I'll take the consequences. Thank right. you very much. And and in the end, you find the deeper magic. Right. <laughs> what the witch there was taking them to with her enchantment was just the magic. Yeah. That was it. Yeah. Down to just just the level of religion, tradition. But they choose the deeper magic, which is God saying, I'm going to bring you to myself. Right. I'm going to reconcile you. Value. Right. Right. It's exactly that same moment that I felt in 2019. Yeah. When after a huge battle <laughs> inside myself. Yeah, and I can I testify to that. Came to the knowing you <laughs> that value was something worth holding on to mm-hmm. and that the logic of the position I held as an atheist lost me everything. Right, right. And what I gained from it was merely a sense of living in my own mind in a way in which I could hold on to, what was it? Some sense that I was in control of reality. Mm -hmm. Instead of saying, okay, there is only one way to hold on to all of these things that I value most dearly, and that's to let go of myself. Right and hold on to the objective reality outside of myself, Mm -hmm. of a transcendent reality that grounds everything. Right, right. And that gave me Jenny. It gave me science. It gave me the beauty and reality of the literary world that expressed the nature of humanity as created in the image of God. It gave me the love that I have for my family. It gave me everything that Mm -hmm. I wanted throughout all of my life. And what did I lose? Hmm. Absolutely nothing. Right, right. And the choice at that point, when I recognized that, was very simple. Mm -hmm. Not that it was easy. I really seriously don't mean it was easy. Right. Because it wasn't. But it was simple. Mm -hmm. This or that. Mm-hmm. And 25 years in the making. Right. And I choose <laughs> Christ. Right. right. That's the side of the mirror that I want to land on. And I have had no regrets. Mm-hmm. And I intend never to have any. Yeah. <laughs> this is the side I want. Right. Right. Okay, John. So if you have nothing more to add to that, nothing more so. to say. Okay. Um, just the emphasis over again that Mm -hmm. I think you and I, over the past four years, have been moving towards this central point, that it is the listeners that we have in every moment of their existence, chewing on the little cords and knots in front of them that make the difference. And also also being willing to creep away You know, the mice crept away away, and then being willing to go farther out, further in. Right. Yeah. Because you can't just 
focus on yeah, on the God. right. You can't just focus on the the not chewing all the time too. It's 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 that just that that journey with God. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he'll show you when you need to chew and when you need to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's interesting because I hadn't even thought about that before this exact moment. There is a moment where the mice, having chewed their individual thing, mm-hmm. they creep away. Right. And where do they go? Well, we find out not here in this one. In this in one, this but we find out later that this was the moment that they became true followers of Aslan, true rational Mm -hmm. images, images of the creator, Mm -hmm. right? That's when God's image was created in them Mm -hmm. and they became living creatures in the sense of possible, right, of following Christ. Right, right, exactly. Exactly. And then comes reap a cheap later on. Right. (laughs) Okay. So I guess that's all we have for this week. By the way, how's your Paradise Lost book coming along, Johnny? Quite well. I mean, last week we published the afterward. No, the foretaste of an afterward. Uh, last week we published the foretaste of our afterward Wait, hold on, to Paradise Lost. And I'm excited about that. I've I've now doubled about the content of that. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it will probably be again doubled. So we'll probably have about twenty pages of, of an after- afterward. <laughs> Is that? And then I've got to draft a fairly short introduction. Is that and eight and then a half we're ready by? To publish this book. Is that an eight and a half by eleven book? Yes, eight and a half by eleven. Okay, and these books are half that size. So it's going to be huge. <laughs> yes, it's going to be a very large book, folks. <laughs> I hope you're right. Actually, most of it will be Paradise Lost, the poem itself. Um, but there's a significant amount of our content as well. Okay, so what's on the what's on the agenda next for the Christian atheists? For the Christian atheists. Whew, I'm not sure. We have to finish our JEDP series, mm-hmm. and that's only one more to go, and we'll get that done. And then we will probably do an interview with the man who inspired it, at least part of it, the Mad Scott. Mm -hmm. And after that, I would imagine we will probably be dealing with G.K. Chesterton, who seems to be looming large in our view these days. Yeah. And then also we were thinking about doing religion, reality, or substitute by C.S. Lewis, too. That's true. Yes. Okay. Well, we'll see. We'll figure it out. Okay, so if you're listening through YouTube, please consider subscribing. We would really appreciate it. Also, if you're interested in knowing more about the Christian Atheist, be sure to check out the link to John's book in the description. It's called Through the Looking Glass, The Imploding of an Atheist Professor's Worldview. And pretty soon we'll have a second book link in the description for your Paradise Lost book. And as always, if you have the means, buy us a cup of coffee. There's a link to that in the description. And we thank you so much for taking time to listen to us. We appreciate you. And we hope you have a great rest of your week. And we'll talk to you next week. Yes. And thank you, my love, for this idea for our No Compromise. I think it was absolutely beautiful Mm -hmm. and very targeted. Yeah, it was. And right on for where we are. And where I think God is taking us on Mm -hmm. this beautiful journey through Narnia. Romp. Yeah, this beautiful romp (laughs) through Narnia. Okay. I I love love you. you. (laughs) Jinx. (laughs) I am a Christian with the searching and skeptical mind of an atheist. I don't want to believe anything that isn't true. I know both sides of the looking glass and I know them with open eyes. I choose Christ's side. I invite you to join me from wherever you stand before the looking glass. That's this week's episode. Thanks for listening. And remember, you can have your religious cake and eat it too. You can have reason, respect for science, a 21st century worldview, and be a Christian.